Hi there, everybody. My name is Joe, and uh, with me here is Dr. Julian Baraka Thomas. Dr. Thomas, uh, uh, can you provide uh, a little bit, sort of a general background of who you are, what it is you do in your, your, your specialty? So uh, I am a, an assistant professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Pennsylvania. I got my PhD from Princeton University in 2014, uh, and my PhD is um, in religious studies. Uh, so I come to the study of Japan with a particular interest in religion and the religions of, in and of Japan. Most of my research focuses on what we think of as being modern and contemporary Japan. So basically for me, that means um, the 20th and, and 21st centuries. I guess my scholarly work is kind of centered on looking at questions of what does it mean to be religious in Japan? Do Japanese people consider themselves religious? And uh, my research looks at things like religion and media, particularly manga and anime. Uh, I also spend time looking at things like religion and politics. I've got a book that I'm working on right now about the politics of religious freedom in Japan. Future projects that I'm thinking about would um, also be looking at things like religion and capitalism, religion and gender, and religion and education in post-war Japan. This is a, um, it's an ex extremely difficult question, but I'm going to do my best to make it very simple. Uh, if you ask, you know, 10 random people on the street in Japan if they're religious, probably nine of them, at least eight of them will tell you, no, they're not religious. And so the, the simple fact of the matter is that Japan, like many late capitalist societies, is one of these places where we see a progressive decline of active professions of religious affiliation. But we would make a mistake if we assumed that that meant that religion was totally absent in Japan. If you look in the right places or if you're willing to adjust your criteria a little bit, um, we see a lot of people still patronizing religious institutions. Uh, people participate avidly in things like festivals. Most funerals still happen in a sort of Buddhist framework, although this is, this is changing somewhat. Uh, and so we can see a fairly rapid and drastic decline of the number of people who say that they are religious, and yet we still see people engaging in behaviors that somebody like myself, who professionally studies religion, would call religious. Uh, so uh, it is, so it's, it's a complicated sort of thing, and, and the, the statistics get even fuzzier because the uh, the numbers that Japanese religious institutions offer about their adherence don't tend to line up with the statistics that other researchers get. So Japanese religious institutions will probably say that they have a really high number of adherents. Um, they try to boost their numbers as much as possible. But journalists or sociologists who go around asking people, do you belong to that institution, would find that the numbers don't tend to, to match up. And so this is a a problem for those of us who study religion in Japan is really difficult to try and parse who's right or just how religious people are. My own approach is to kind of focus on what people do rather than what they say. When I was looking at manga and anime, I realized that I wasn't so much interested in whether there were there was religious content in the products that I was examining. Although that's important. You know, we could say that a manga like Saint Young Men, which uh, is about Jesus and Buddha, is clearly religious because it's got these religious protagonists. But I was more interested in how people seem to be constructing what I would call a religious disposition or a religious attitude or even religious beliefs based on their reading of manga or their viewing of anime. And I came to call that a religious frame of mind. And I chose that phrasing because I was trying to think very specifically about how the medium manga or the medium of anime might sort of structure the way that people are thinking about the world. So I used frame uh, specifically because in uh, manga, you know, you have manga are, are constructed at one of the most basic levels in terms of these individual frames that are then juxtaposed to create a story. And, and by looking at one frame and then the next, the viewer sort of has to fill in the gaps in between those frames to make the story make sense. And I think that there's something similar in the way that somebody could look at a manga and then look at her real life and kind of fill the gaps 
between, say, uh, real life and the fictional world of manga and try to construct a, a new sort of religious identity or a religious viewpoint based on that. A examples that I used in the book would be, say, like, people who are really inspired by a protagonist in a particular film or a particular manga, and then because they're inspired by that, they choose to change the way that they live their lives. So they may actually talk about that person being an inspiration or a role model. Or another way that this sort of works is, let's say that somebody knows that a particular temple or shrine is the basis for the temple or shrine that appears in their favorite anime series. So it could be a series like Lucky Star. And if people know that Washimiya Shrine in Washinomiya City is, is the basis for the shrine that appears in that anime, then they may choose to go on pilgrimages to that shrine, they may actually make donations to that shrine, and so on. And their behavior may be somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but nevertheless, it's a, an individual interacting with a religious institution based on um, his or her experience uh, of that religious institution um, kind of mediated through anime. So I chose the phrasing religious frame of mind as a way of kind of pointing to how these compositional techniques or framing techniques that are used in manga and anime um, could also be used sort of metaphorically to understand how people imaginatively combine their, their real lives with fictional worlds. Haruhiism as a phenomenon, if it is a phenomenon that, that we can define, seems to me to be a perfect sort of example of um, what I've called in my book a religious frame of mind, or what I called in, in an earlier article Shukyo Asobi, which is basically like um, religious entertainment or entertaining religion, that Haruhi, upholding Haruhi as an object of religious devotion is potentially tongue-in-cheek. I doubt that that many people would say, well, I really believe she's a deity. And yet, by acting as if she is a deity and um, venerating her and um, coming up with prayers that are devoted to her, as I found on Wikipedia, it, you, know, you have these, um, these things where distinguishing between Haruhiism and, and any other sort of history-based religion becomes a little bit difficult. Now, I do want to say that the tongue-in-cheek aspect of it makes it difficult to to assess just how sincere this is. And measuring sincerity is, is a great challenge for those of us who study religion. But yeah, Haruhiism, I guess I would say, for the sake of the argument, why not treat it as being a real religion? You know, in the same way that there's the Church of the Latter-day Dude, which, you know, veneration of the, the Jeff Bridges character in The Big Lebowski, we have plenty of evidence that this sort of thing has happened in the past and will probably continue to happen in the future. So why not have Haruhiism? And this is something that is not limited to Japan or to or, or to fans of, of manga and anime, although it, certainly we see that. You know, I, I think let's just take the manga and anime sort of crowd or contingent. You could say that act of cosplay has a tongue-in-cheek component that people don't really think that they are, say, members of the Survey Corps in Attack on Titan, even if they dress up in their 3D maneuvering gear. And yet, when they put on that costume, they behave as if they are members of the Survey Corps. Or somebody may go to the gym as if he, like One Punch Man, can become just as strong. And and I think that that's, that's really fascinating. We see it um, in, in, other, in other places. There, there used to be a tendency, and I think there still is a strong tendency, to draw a distinction between, say, belief-based religion and practice-based religion. And for a while, some people, some of my colleagues in the field of East Asian religious studies wanted to say that religious practice in East Asia was much more practice-based and, and less about assenting to these propositional statements of belief. I think that's true to a certain extent, but really, I mean, even if we look at practice, most ritual practice serves as evidence of some sort of belief. So just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not saying that we should just throw belief out, out the window as a component of, of religion, but that's partially why I think that um, fiction, studying fiction and religion together is so fascinating, because when we're engaging with fiction, if it's done well, we really believe it. 
I read a novel recently called A Little Life. I think it came out last year. It's set in New York. It's about some young men. Uh, whatever. The, uh, it's this tragic novel, and there are several points during the novel where I found myself gritting my teeth, squeezing my fingernails into the chair as I was reading, because there are just these grueling scenes, like really horrific scenes in this novel, and I was feeling it viscerally. I knew I was reading a novel, and yet the novel was so real to me that I almost felt like I was, you know, I did feel like I was vicariously experiencing something that one of these characters had gone through. I won't spoil it, but I do recommend the novel. And, and I think that that's a way in which, at least temporarily, I believed that I was maybe not this person, but I believed that I was close enough to this person that I could sort of empathize with the things that he was undergoing. That I think that's a really striking aspect of fiction that is very common to it, um, and, and, and that a lot of us experience fiction in this way. Anime and manga provide really good tools to think with, not just think about. And so one of the things that I try to do in my Japanese pop culture class is to use particular live action films or anime or manga to think about what's going on in contemporary Japanese society today. And there's a lot to be done there. And I guess what I'm saying is that it's not just, you know, something that we sit around and absorb, but that we can actually um, be very deliberate and disciplined in our approach to thinking with a director like Kon Satoshi or, or with a manga artist like Urasawa Naoki or, or Nakamura Hikaru. Uh, so, um, I'm really looking forward to uh, an ongoing conversation with, with you and, and with your viewers about, about all of these things.